podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. There's still a lot of people entering the event, so we will give them a moment and we'll begin shortly. Welcome again, everyone, to today's G4 Water 101 session. My name is Stacey Isaac Barraza, and I'm with a consulting firm called IB Environmental. We are assisting G4 with today's webinar. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, the main goal of the webinar today is to really empower you as local government staff to at least before you engage external consultants maybe in the process to start the, the application process on your own. Uh, the staff at GIFA are very approachable and you can contact them with questions and they tend to be pretty responsive. They actually, you know, as staff of especially the SRF program, which we'll be hearing a lot about today, they're under some pressure to get the funds loaned out. So they want to talk to you. So I wanna encourage you to take advantage of the information you hear today, but feel free to reach out to these folks um, individually afterwards, because they, they are very interested in, in hearing your questions and, and learning about the potential projects that you want to fund in your community. In general, it's great to get support from your consulting team, et cetera, but we also want to underscore as part of the objectives today that at the end of the day, you as the local government folks are the ones responsible for this, this loan that you might get from the SRF program or the Georgia Fund. Um, you're responsible for the requirements from the federal government when you, when you undertake this process. So it's really important that even if you get external support, you understand what you're getting into. Um, and today's uh, webinar should show you that it's, it's pretty easy for even starting the pre-application process, right? So we'll run through all of that today. And again, hopefully you feel, you feel empowered. Um, we want the session to be very interactive as well, and there are several ways that we can encourage interaction with the GoToWebinar platform. So I'll just kind of run through uh, some logistics on how GoToWebinar works. At this point, I am guessing that a lot of you are unfortunately very familiar with this platform, but just in case to sort of um, reiterate some of the, the features, uh, you have polls in the, in the GoToWebinar. Um, and we'll bring those up. Uh, someone will read the questions out. We, we encourage you to go ahead and, and give your responses there, hit submit, and we will um, we'll read those out and share it with the, with the rest of the group. Um, there's also gonna be a Q&A or an evaluation form at the end. Sorry, not, not a Q&A. We will have a Q&A session where you can put in your questions um, throughout the webinar. So you don't need to wait until the very end when you'll be doing the official Q&A, you can put your questions in all along. So there's a questions box um, that you will see uh, towards the bottom of your control panel. But let's start at the beginning with a control panel. 
this little red uh, rectangle with the white horizontal arrow lets you sort of minimize or maximize your own control panel. And then you should see some of these features here. The raise hand feature will use at least a couple times during the, the webinar today to get feedback from you all or get volunteers in some cases. But you can also use it if you're having some technical difficulties and we'll try to get one of our team members here to assist you directly with your issues. Um, you'll also see on your control panel that we have handouts. Um, so the slides that you'll be seeing presented today, including this one, are gonna be available to you as a downloadable PDF from your control panel. So feel free to download that and follow along. I mean, they don't have all the content that the speakers will be mentioning, but you can at least make notes on it, et cetera, if you like. So that's, that's one option that's available to you. The session will be recorded as well, and we'll send an email out uh, in the next week or so, letting you know when that's available. Um, but the raise hand feature, again, is one way to, to get our attention, and we'll actually ask you at some point to raise your hand if you want to volunteer for something. Please put in questions all along the way and do respond to the polls when they come up, and especially that evaluation that's gonna come up at the very end. We're actually going to use the, the input from you on that evaluation to design and tweak the content of upcoming webinars in this series. So we look forward to your, um, your input there. So I believe that that kind of covers the logistics when it comes to GoToWebinar. In terms of our agenda today, um, we are going to, we're in the middle, obviously, of the welcome and the go to webinar introduction. We're also going to have uh, two main speakers from GIFA. So Sarah Oaken is going to give you sort of an overview of GIFA and then get into the water stuff a little bit more. And I'll say at this point that there's a very brief overview of GIFA and its energy programs, et cetera. But the bulk of today's session is on water. So we're calling this Water 101. Um, and then I will do a quick demonstration of the intended use plan that both Sarah and Larry will be talking about. And then Larry is going to go into a lot more detail on the call for projects and actually sort of walk you through the application and the pre-application process. So again, put your questions in all throughout. We'll be queuing those up sort of behind the scenes here and addressing them to the speakers at the end of the webinar. Uh, so we'll have a hopefully, hopefully a robust Q&A session and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I'll go ahead and note too, in terms of the agenda, that your calendar would probably have reserved two hours for this. Um, and we don't plan to take the full two hours, so we ask you to be really engaged in this hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. Um, uh, the, and then we also really want you to take some of the time that we have slotted on your calendars to fill out that evaluation form at the end and give us some good feedback there. All right, so let's test out one of these interactive um, items. Let's uh, bring up a poll question. So our first poll question is going to be uh, read out now by Ansley. Thanks, Stacy. So our first question for you is, has your community obtained a GFA loan in the last 10 years? Give you just a few more seconds to answer that. All right, great. 85% of the participants said yes, and 15% said no. So hopefully you all will learn something today. Excellent. All right, then we have a second poll question. All right, the next question is, how familiar are you with GIFA's loan programs? Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar? See the results coming in. Give you a few more seconds. All right, great. We had 15% that were very familiar, 73% said somewhat familiar, and 12% said not at all familiar. Okay, that's great. So we're all here for a reason this morning. That's that's good. Um, so hopefully we'll kind of maybe bump some people up in terms of their level of familiarity with today's webinar. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ansley. And we'll now start transitioning over to our first speaker, Sarah Oaken. So Sarah is a project manager at GIFA. 
She has been with the organization for three years. Sarah has a bachelor's degree from Tulane University and her master's in public administration is from Georgia State University. So thanks Sarah for joining us and take it away. Everything's looking good, Sarah. Great. My name is Sarah Oaken and I'm a project manager with GIFA. About GIFA's programs, its divisions, um, the various loan programs GIFA has, the application process, and conservation financing. First, a little bit about GIFA. GIFA was founded in 1985 to facilitate programs that can serve and protect Georgia's energy, land, and water resources. GIFA provides loans for water, wastewater, and solid waste infrastructure, manages energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, administers land conservation loans, and manages and monitors state-owned fuel storage tanks. To date, GIFA has funded over 1,900 projects worth over $4.6 billion. GIFA's work is supported by both the clean, excuse me, supported by both the energy and water resources divisions. The energy resources division promotes energy conservation, sustainable growth, and the development of renewable energy sources through several energy programs. The weatherization assistance program is available to eligible households in all of Georgia's 159 counties. This program provides free energy conservation measures and addresses health and safety concerns. Energy performance contracting allows the state to finance building improvements designed to lower energy and water consumption. The Energy Assurance Program works closely with Georgia's Emergency Management Agency, other state agencies, and private sector stakeholders to develop emergency planning resources and to lead exercises designed to ensure better emergency coordination. The Fuel Storage Tank Program provides oversight and monitoring services for 63 fuel storage tanks at 23 state agencies. The Water Resources Division, which will be the focus of today's webinar, supports the development of water, wastewater, and solid waste infrastructure. These types of projects help protect the environment facilitate economic development, accommodate population growth, and safeguard public health. The next portion of the presentation will be about GFIS project eligibility, the application process, and conservation. But first, we'll have a quick poll question to test your knowledge of GFIS. All right, thanks, Sarah. We're pulling that question right up. All right, you should be seeing on your screen. When is the best time to come to GIFA when planning an infrastructure project? As early as possible, two months before funding is needed, after bidding out a project, or after breaking ground on the project. All right, wonderful. 100% of folks said as early as possible, that's the correct answer. Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Ansley. So, who's eligible to borrow from GIFA? Entities that can borrow from GIFA are local governments, county or local water, sewer, and sanitary districts, state or local authorities, boards or political subdivisions, and non-governmental entities whose primary mission is land conservation. So there are certain minimum requirements that must be met if an organization, excuse me, if an entity wants to borrow from GIFA. Municipalities and counties must be certified as qualified local governments by the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, or DCA. Municipalities, counties, and authorities must be included in a DCA-verified service delivery strategy. The project for which an applicant seeks financing must be consistent with the verified strategy. It's important for communities to be compliant with up-to-date service delivery strategy 
to minimize any duplication or competition among local governments or authorities for providing services. Additionally, service delivery strategies provide a method of resolving disputes among service providers regarding service delivery, funding equity, and land use. Borrowers must be in compliance with state audit requirements. According to the official code of Georgia, local governments that don't submit acceptable audit reports to the state auditor are subject to the provision of state law that no state agency shall make or transmit any state grant funds to any local government which has failed to provide all audits required by law within the preceding five years. Next, borrowers located within the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District must be in compliance or making a good faith effort to comply with all Metro Planning District plans and enforcement measures. Municipalities and counties must adopt OCGA 8-2-3 related to the installation of high efficiency plumbing fixtures. Current borrowers who wish to borrow additional funds from GFA must be uh, in compliance with all their existing credit documents. Authority borrowers that do not have taxing ability must be backstopped by a city or a county to borrow from GFA unless their debt service coverage ratio is 1.25 times or greater. And I'll speak a little bit more about debt service coverage ratios a little bit later in the presentation. Lastly, NGOs that wish to utilize GFA funding must be nonprofit organizations with the primary purpose of permanently protecting land and conserving natural resources as evidenced by their organizational documents. Moving on, I'll now talk about GFA's funding programs. GFA's funding programs include the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and the Georgia Fund. The Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, or DWSRF, is a federally funded loan program for infrastructure, water infrastructure projects. The DWSRF can fund many types of projects, including those related to water treatment, transmission and distribution, storage, source, consolidation, and the creation of new systems. Projects that are not eligible for the drinking water SRF are those whose primary purposes are economic development or fire protection, and those that construct reservoirs. The Clean Water SRF is a federally funded loan program for wastewater infrastructure and pollution prevention projects. Eligible project types include those that construct, repair, or upgrade wastewater treatment plants, expanding sewer infrastructure, rehabilitating sewer infrastructure, stormwater projects, water reuse, and projects that help control non-point source pollution. The annual borrowing cap for both of these pro uh, loan programs is $25 million. Next, we have the Georgia Fund. The Georgia Fund is a state-funded loan program for water, wastewater, and solid waste infrastructure. GFA primarily utilizes the Georgia Fund for emergency loans, economic development projects, constructing reservoirs, and projects related to landfills and solid waste. The annual borrowing cap for the Georgia Fund is $3 million. Moving on, now I'd like to speak about the application process. Application can be found on GFA's website. GFA's board meets quarterly, and applications must be submitted at least two months prior to the desired board meeting. So here we have a picture of what the application looks like. The first page asks for contact information from the borrower. Next, section two asks for project information. The first question asks the borrower what funding source they're looking to borrow from and what intended use plan the project is on. All federally funded pro projects must be included in an intended use plan. And as Stacy mentioned earlier, she'll be going into a little bit more detail about the intended use plan or IUP. Next question is a reference to the State Environmental Review Process or SERP. The SERP will be discussed in greater detail in a later session. The following section asks for a description of the project. The description helps the GFA project manager determine if the project is eligible for funding, develop project scope for the loan agreement, and determine if there are any conservation elements to the project. 
So in this section, the applicant will enter project budget, desired loan term, as well as the schedule. In the project cost section, you would also enter any additional funding sources that we use for the project, such as CDBG or ARC funds. The schedule section is used by the project managers to determine the most appropriate board date for the project and to calculate the repayment date for the loan agreement. Below the schedule, you'll see the desired loan amortization period section. GFA offers loan terms from as little as five to up to 30 years. And we ask borrowers to certify that the useful life of the assets funded by the loan exceed the amortization period of the loan. Lastly, in this section, you'll confirm that the proposed project is consistent with the service delivery strategy. Next, section three asks the borrower to certify that if their project is over a certain cost threshold, that the architectural and engineering services were competitively procured. This, uh, this topic will be discussed at a future GFA Water 101 session. Next, section four requests applicant information to ensure that the borrower is eligible for GFA funding and whether a community is a water first or plan first community. These designations will be discussed later in the presentation. So the remainder of the application is for the applicant to provide financial information, such as accounting data, water and sewer rate structure, expenses, revenue history, and projections to support the underwriting process. So the reason I wanted to talk about the application today is to show that it's, it's fairly simple to fill out and take a little bit of mystery out of the process. I'd like to speak a little bit more in detail about the underwriting process. GFA's fiscal department uses the information the borrower provides in the application and four years of financials to underwrite the loan. Underwriting team must ensure that a community's operations demonstrate an average debt service coverage of 1.05 times or greater measured over five year performa. GFA's minimum debt service coverage is 1.05 times. So a debt service coverage ratio of 1.05 times means that over every dollar generated from a borrower's operational cash flow, five cents is available to go towards other capital projects or investments outside of debt service payments. Comparatively, a debt service coverage ratio of one is considered break even. And a financial hiccup at break even could cause serious financial hardships for a borrower. The debt service coverage ratio is calculated by dividing cash flows or available income by debt service or principal and interest payments for bank loans, GFA loans, bonds, and capital leases. So now we have another poll question for everyone. Make sure everybody's still with us and awake this morning. Thanks, Sarah. So the question reads, oh, I'm sorry, please. Let me know if it's showing the current question. Um, how often does GFA's board meet? Is it quarterly, twice a year, once a year, or every month? That question is showing answer. Wonderful. Just a few more seconds. Great, 79% answered the correct answer of quarterly. Um, thank you very much for participating. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Ansley. So here we have a table that displays our interest rates. Um, you can see here our various interest rates for all the different loan terms. And as you can see, conservation projects, as well as projects for communities that are water first or plan first designation get an interest rate reduction. Now, I know what you're thinking. Could I be plan first and water first and a conservation project and get an additional interest rate reduction? Fortunately, there's just one interest rate concession per project. GFA finances water conservation projects in areas of utility water loss and end use water efficiency. 
A 1% interest rate reduction is available on water conservation loans made from the Georgia Fund, CWSRF, and DWSRF. So some examples of the water conservation projects include replacement and repair of leaking water lines, installing automatic meter reading systems or automatic meter reading infrastructure, projects that help eliminate line breaks through pressure management, and installing high efficiency fixtures. Some examples of energy conservation projects include alternative energy, produ using alternative energy production projects at wastewater and water treatment plants and energy conservation projects, such as those that reduce the need for pumping and make energy uh, efficient upgrades uh, in the infrastructure. Project examples include inflow and infiltration reduction, elimination of pump stations, and installing SCADA equipment. So the third type of conservation project are those that reduce non-point source pollution. Non-point source pollution is caused by rainfall or snow melt moving over and through the ground. As the runoff moves, it picks up and carries away pollutants and deposits them in bodies of water and groundwater. Examples of projects that prevent polluted runoff from reaching our waterways include those that conserve and stabilize land, construct green infrastructure, or eliminate faulty septic systems. Moving on, other interest rate considerations are if borrowers are water first or plan first communities. The water first designation is for local governments that demonstrate a commitment to responsible water stewardship. If you'd like to learn more about what it means to be a water first community or how to apply, please see the link below. GIFA also offers webinars to give communities a chance to hear from current Water First designees and to educate interested communities about the benefits of the Water First program. Plan First is the Department of Community Affairs program to recognize and reward communities that demonstrate a pattern of successfully implementing their local comprehensive plan. Here you can see our blended interest rate calculation. Some projects have some elements that are not eligible for a conservation interest rate and some elements that are. In that case, we have the engineer fill out the blended interest rate calculator to help determine the appropriate interest rate for the loan. Now we have one more poll question for everyone here. Test your GIFA knowledge. <laughs> so which of the following would not be eligible for GIFA funding? Installing water main? constructing a wastewater treatment plant, constructing a landfill, or installing broadband. All right, give you a few more seconds here. All right. So 85% of you said installing broadband, which was the correct answer. We can fund constructing a landfill out of our Georgia Fund program. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you for listening today. I hope some of this information was helpful. And if you want to know anything more about GFIS programs, divisions, application process, or conservation financing, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Thank you again. Excellent, thanks so much, Sarah, for that information. Um, we will continue here with um, heading into the IUP um, document that Sarah mentioned. Before I start sort of showing you how to navigate to that, uh, a reminder to the audience to submit your questions in the questions box. So we have a couple questions in there, but we are very open to getting some more questions. So you've given up, you know, an hour plus of your time this morning, make it count. Uh, go ahead and, and submit the questions that your community is really um, curious about. Uh, I also want to use the raise hand feature here for a moment. So please go to your control panel and raise your hand if you can see the handout in the control panel. So there's a PDF in there and it's called um, G4 Water 101 Session 1 Handout. Um, raise your hand if you can see that. And we'll just kind of make sure everyone can find it and that everyone is engaged. All 
All right, excellent. We see lots of hands up. So people are able to access that and you are, you are with us, you're paying attention, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to um, go ahead here and navigate to this document that we've referred to a couple times already called uh, the intended use plan. So first, we're gonna just kind of use this as a, an excuse to navigate the GFO website a little bit. This is how you can find that document online. And basically this search button here is pretty handy. I might just turn off my camera for this demo to make it a little bit more focused on what we're doing here. So if you start looking up or typing in here intended use plan, so Here's a little bit of background on the two SRF programs that Sarah was talking about. And then you can find the 2020 CLEAN or IUP for short, uh, or the drinking water one. For today's purposes, I'll pull up the drinking water SRF. But again, remember that there are two different federal programs. Just a tiny bit of background. Um, each state has a clean water and drinking water SRF program that's run at the state level. But the main funding comes from the, from the federal government. So they provide um, the bulk of the money and the state has to come up with a 20% match of the funds that they're going to get from the federal government. And they are used for different purposes. So clean water SRF obviously relates to things like wastewater projects and stormwater and green infrastructure projects more than um, the drinking water SRF. Drinking water SRF does have an opportunity for some green infrastructure in, in some cases, um, but it's mainly, as the name suggests, drinking water projects. So just a little uh, reiteration of the distinction there. So once you click on the 2020 drinking water uh, SRF IUP, it should download in, on, your, on your screen in the, the bottom corner, at least for me. And this is what the document looks like. So um, it's a great one-stop shop for a lot of the things that you're hearing on the webinar today. So again, this demo is kind of, it's twofold to show you how to navigate the website. It's, it's pretty easy and I think user-friendly, but this particular document that we're pulling up um, does give a lot of, it's like a one-stop shop for a lot of the, the things that you're hearing about today. So let's see, of, of course we have our, our trusty little table of contents here. This background might not be interesting um, to all of you, but I think the solicitation process, um, this, this paragraph is a good summary of that. So you might find that useful. The itemizers all of the concerning, and then there's one that um, in Georgia at least is called the fundable list. And it looks at the specific projects from the big list that seem like they will be funded for, for the given year. So uh, we won't look in detail at the list, sort of at the, the back of this document. Uh, if you want to see what the, the conservation financing terms are like that uh, Sarah mentioned and Larry's gonna talk a little bit more about as well, this principal forgiveness based on a full for you. This is the 20% match that I that I mentioned. It's not something that the communities in Georgia, the utilities don't have to worry about this match. Um, I'll tell you, IB Environmental does interact with a lot of different states SRF programs and, and Georgia has a good program, very robust. Um, there are some states that we worry sometimes in some years, if can they even find this 20% match in order to receive the federal funding? Uh, we don't, we've never seen those kinds of issues in Georgia. They tend to be pretty, they meet their deadlines. Um, they meet the, the goals and objectives that EPA has set out for them uh, as the federal government. And um, they're also pretty innovative and flexible. So your goal as potential borrowers is to tell the staff at GFA what you need, um, what issues are coming up, what types of projects you need funding, funding for. And they tend to be pretty flexible and, and innovative, and they'll sometimes tweak the programs as far as the federal government will allow them in order to meet the needs of the state. So yeah, again, a pretty robust program, and we don't normally have to worry about this 20% match. This is probably less relevant, but I did want to stop at this public participation um, point here in the IUP. So last year, we have the date here, um, and because of COVID, you're going to hear that it's going to be via like teleconference this year, but there is an opportunity for you as potential borrowers, et cetera, to participate in this process and, and give some input on the IUP. So I believe that's gonna be June 15th this year, but more information is coming on that in a later slide. 
these are some of the very long lists I was telling you about earlier. And we'll just scroll down, I think, to the last attachment here, which shows criteria um, that you have in this field. It's another rundown of that process. Okay, I think um, not too much else I want to say here about, about the IUP. So I'm going to start to get ready to um, pass this to our next speaker, um, Larry Paul Jr. So hopefully Larry's getting all set up here on, on his end and we'll stop sharing my screen. But also wanted to mention that debt service coverage ratio that Sarah talked to you about of 1.05 is pretty low, even when we compare it to the SRF programs in other states. Um, that, that's not a very high bar to meet. So again, just a, another testament for, for the robustness of the program here. So Larry Paul Jr. is a project manager at GIFA. He is going to be our next speaker. He's been at GIFA for two years, nine months, so almost three years. He has a bachelor's degree from Southern University and um, he has his MBA from Mercer University here in Georgia. So we just want to welcome you, Larry. Um, your slides are looking fine, so take it away and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. All right, thanks, uh, Stacy, for that introduction. And uh, as she mentioned, I am uh, I'm also a project manager here at GIFA in the Water Resource Department. And today, uh, I'll be discussing uh, the pre-application period, project score, affordability score, and affordability uh, score tool. We'll give a demonstration of that towards the end uh, of my presentation. So hopefully, uh, some of the communities out there would uh, like to participate in. Uh, see what this score is. But before we get into all that, uh, we have another poll question to see if you guys are still with us. All right, you should see the question on your screen. In what month does GIFA open the call for projects? Is it February, April, September, or May? All right, this is a good question to gauge, you know, the knowledge of the audience and we're getting a big mix of responses. So Larry's going to be providing this information. Uh, we had 48% of folks say February, 13% say April, 30% say September and 9% said May. All right, and back to you, Larry. All right, thank you, Angela. So 30% of you guys were on point. Uh, Annual GIFA's uh, annual call for projects uh, begins in September and it closes uh, at the end of February. <clears throat> in order to be considered for principal forgiveness, applicants must uh, submit a pre-application to be included in the SRF intended use plan. Keep in mind that uh, pre-application only ensures an opportunity to receive PF. Uh, it's not a guaranteed thing. I also like to mention that uh, applicants can submit an application anytime during the year, but in order to be eligible for principal forgiveness, you must submit a pre-application during the designated time. If you submit an application outside of that designated time, uh, we, you can still get on the IUP, but we'll hold a public meeting to uh, get that uh, approved by the board. Principal forgiveness is also, uh, just a little background on principal forgiveness, Principal forgiveness is an additional subsidy provided by the federal government to assist music, 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 excuse me, municipalities that it would, would experience uh, significant hardship raising the revenue necessary to finance needed infrastructure projects. Uh, PF is used to reduce the size of the loan, thus reducing the annual principal and interest payments. And here you see uh, a proposed timeline for funding. Uh, keep in mind, this is just for the 2020 funding period for college projects, uh, and things are subject to change, uh, as with anything in these days. Uh, you can also find this information on GIFA's website and to find the most, uh, most up-to-date information on each particular item. You can find the links for both SRF programs uh, on the website, as well as a call for projects letter. Uh, we also send an email blast out to communities, letting them know when the call for projects uh, is in effect. Uh, the pre-application is very easy to complete, and it's designed to 
be completed pretty much in one session. Uh, I'd like to point out that you cannot uh, save your progress and you will receive an email confirmation of on submittal. Please review the confirmation email when you receive it to ensure that all your information is correct uh, going forward. If you need to change uh, your pre-application, that's not a problem. Uh, you would have to resubmit a new pre-application, but make sure you reach out to one of the PMs here at GIFA uh, to, leak, to delete your old one. And here we have an uh, example of the screen you have come up, uh, you'll come up to once you click the link on our website to get into the pre-application. Like I said before, it's pretty simple to uh, complete. Uh, anybody can go through and, and, and knock it out in one session. And if, like, like uh, Stacy mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, you can reach out to any of us. But this fir first thing you come to is uh, the application information. And if you can notice, uh, some items have a red asterisk bomb. And th these items are required. You know, we, we, we would encourage you to read all items and fill as much information as you can, but the items with the red asterisk are required. The next section you will come up to is a certification for uh, A&E procurement. Uh, likewise, complete, every, uh, complete, complete all information that pertains to your project and community and make sure you complete all uh, items with a red asterisk. The next thing, screen is uh, project readiness. Uh, this is a very important screen because uh, it weighs heavy in the scoring, uh, as you will see later on in, in um, our scoring discussion. So take your time and make sure you throw which information with this, this part right here. Then we'll come to compliance benefits. You'll notice that compliance benefits don't have a red asterisk bomb, but they're equally important. So take your time and go through and make sure you uh, select the items that pertain to your project. Uh, and then you'll come to project benefits. Uh, just like compliance benefits, they don't have a, a red asterisk, but they are important. So take your time, go through and select the items that pertain to your uh, your community, your project. And then you come up to the certification where you put your name, title, and date. And, and that's pretty much it. So it's a very simple process, but you want to make sure you uh, complete it in its entirety, including all supplemental documents, uh, because this will help you out in the scoring process, as you will see coming up shortly. And uh, GIFA has two, two ways, two Projects receive two scores, uh, the first of which is the project score, and the second one is affordability score. So right now we'll go into the project score uh, and get, get into the details of how we operate that. And the project score is the possibility out of 100, 100 possible points. And uh, this information is submitted by the pre-application that I just ran through. So that's why it's uh, important to complete that pre-application in its entirety because that directly feeds into the score. And here we have a breakdown of the drinking water SRF uh, program. And uh, as you can see, the four uh, areas are readiness to proceed, public health compliance, benefits, project benefits, and uh, other applicant and project attributes. Again, all this information is pulled from that uh, pre-application. And now we'll look at the uh, clean water score and breakdown. Clean water is, uh, the water, the, the criteria is a little different, but the scoring methods are all the same. So again, this information is pulled from your uh, pre-application and uh, it's still, you know, ready to proceed, compliance benefits, project benefits and uh, some cons conservation energy uh, and production uh, benefits. All right, we'll move on. Uh, now we'll get into uh, the affordability score. Uh, the affordability uh, score is based on five, uh, 10 criteria that will make up your final score. And they are, uh, as you see on the screen, median household income, unemployment percent, percentage not in the labor force, poverty rate, percentage on Social Security, uh, your population trend, 
a percentage on supplemental security income, percentage with cash public assistance, uh, percentage on supplemental nutrition assistance program, also known as SNAP, and uh, last is uh, age dependency ratio. But we'll get into that right now. And here's a, this slide breaks down the first five uh, criteria and how they're broken off into percentiles. Uh, the percentiles are 25th, 50th, 75th, and 100 percentiles, along with the awarded points for each percentile uh, that you land up in. And uh, here's a, this slide shows the last five uh, criteria, but if you notice the uh, population trend, uh, it doesn't use a percentile. It uses uh, percentages of growth, uh, of, of negative growth. So that's different, and you'll be able to see that when we pull up uh, an example of uh, the of affordability uh, score tool. And speaking of the assessment tool, uh, here here's a snapshot of what that tool looks like. Uh, table one basically goes over the general, general information uh, of the community, uh, they use utility. Uh, table two is a scoring system of, the, of nine of the 10 criteria we looked at. And then table three goes into the population trend information uh, that I said was different, didn't include a percentile. And table four shows you uh, the community's data for each criteria in this, in which uh, the end results is the total score at the bottom of the sheet. And here's a closer snapshot of the community. The example on here is Bowman, uh, and those are their, uh, the, the data collected for, from that city's utility. And you can see their total score is seven, 37 out of a possible 40. All right. And here is a, a snapshot of the scoring spreadsheet and uh, the corresponding scores that uh, uh, are important. And we at GIFA uh, score all pre-applications and rank the projects in descending order. Uh, GIFA will as, uh, will fund as many eligible products, uh, I mean projects, excuse me, as funding is available, going down in that ascending order. Uh, you know, the goal of GIFA is, is always uh, provide principal forgiveness to the most disadvantaged communities uh, that come across our uh, scoring system. And this is a snapshot of some of the most recent communities that were awarded principal forgiveness. As you can see, it's quite a few. Uh, so even though we're going to send an order, we, we still reach a lot of communities. Right. Uh, we're not really gonna get into the environmental review process. That'll be covered in a later session, but I wanted to take the time out to uh, reiterate, reiterate the importance of starting this process uh, as early as possible. The, of course, the state environmental review process, commonly known as the CERT process, is uh, conducted by the Georgia Environmental Protection Division. This is required for financing through the Clean Water and Drinking Water SRF revolving funds, and it's pretty time intensive. Uh, these two links that you'll see in your uh, PDF shows you in detail the process uh, of each going, whether you're going for a categorical exclusion, also known as a CE, or a notice of non-significant impact, known as a NUNSI. And in our, uh, our expectancy is one to three months for a categorical exclusion, and three to four months for a NUNSI. So, you know, you can't stress enough uh, the importance of starting this process early as possible. And that goes back into the, the readiness to proceed uh, items in our scoring. Uh, 
which is very highly uh, rated and, you know, point wise. So, you know, please can't stress enough to uh, start this process as early as possible. And we also want to mention the public meeting. Uh, the purpose of the public meeting is to present uh, and receive comments on the IUP for the 2021 uh, COFA projects. And those are uh, scheduled to be posted June 1st. Uh, and then the meeting, of course, is held June 15th to discuss those projects and receive feedback and comment from the public uh, on those uh, items on the IUP. Uh, as Stacy mentioned earlier, uh, we're still um, following COVID-19 precautions. So to participate in this public meeting, uh, please utilize the following uh, toll-free conference number and conference code. Uh, this will be in your PDF uh, document. So we encourage you to come out and uh, participate. And we like to right now show you a demo of the affordability tool in action. Um, and is gonna pull that up. We have a couple of communities we're gonna go through. Thank you, Angela. So this spreadsheet will provide a glimpse into how GFA can quickly calculate an affordability score for communities. Uh, GFA contracted with the UNC Environmental Finance Center to develop a tool that GFA can use for a scoring process. All of this data in the spreadsheet is from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey, which is updated annually. So a community's affordability score could change annually. Table two and table three show the 10 met metrics that I spoke of earlier. As you can see, for each metric, a SWAN system is shown. The key thing to note is that the affordability score tells you for how the community compares relative to the data for the state of Georgia as a whole. The scoring system just, just corresponds to the quartiles, as you can see here in table seven, that the borrower falls into. For example, take the first metric, uh, median household income. You'll see that the community in the first quartile, meaning the lowest income, will score the maximum of four points for that metric. Look, and, and again, we're going for the most uh, disadvantaged communities here. This will make more sense when we show it in action. Uh, Alan's gonna select the city of Sylvester from the drop down list and uh, immediately after selecting that, uh, their census data are populated into table four, as you see below. Uh, on the far right column, you can see the points associated with uh, Sylvester's metrics. And uh, at the bottom of the sheet, you can see the total score, which is just the score of the 10 metrics added together. And Sylvester scored at 35 out of a maximum of 40 points. So it's not a complicated system. Uh, it's pretty much automated. Uh, and we could reach out to any community uh, within the state of Georgia to find out this information. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, we want to ask uh, you to use the raise hand feature again. If you would like to see your community demonstrated right now in this tool, please go ahead and use the raise hand feature. And while folks are looking for that, we're giving everyone a chance to volunteer themselves or their community. I want to say that as simple as this tool is to use, the good news is you don't have to use it, right? The staff at G4 would be the ones to plug your community's name in and run the tool for you and give you the score. But we thought this was a good opportunity to kind of show you behind the scenes how, how they get those scores. Um, and to underscore what Larry said, this data all comes from census. Um, so, you know, the staff there is just pulling data that already exists in that census. Okay, lots of hands raised. Um, we'll just have to pick one. So. Everybody else, if you really want to interact with Chief of Staff on your particular community, you'll have to do it sort of offline, unfortunately. But Cedar Town has volunteered. So let's let's go with Cedar Town, Ansley, as our next example. And you can see there, as mm -hmm. soon as the community is plugged in, the, the numbers change, the number of points has changed to, to 30. 
Ansley or Larry, anything you want to add about this? No, no. Like, we, like Stacey said, we encourage you to reach out. Uh, if you have questions about this, uh, want to see where you what, what your score looks like. Okay. So are we kind of completed with the tool demo here, Larry? Should we move on? Yes, yes. Uh, we're done with it. We can wrap up. Excellent. Okay. So, so um, yeah, there's your contact information. You want to go over that, Larry? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, here's my contact, contact information. Sarah shared her information. But feel free to reach out to any of the project managers here at GIFA. Uh, we'll be glad to help you. And uh, hopefully this demystifies some of the processes and programs we have at GIFA. Uh, it's nothing complicated. You, know, you can do it yourself, like uh, Stacey mentioned earlier, uh, with outside uh, consultants. But, you know, feel free to use them if you want. And that's about it. Thank you for your time. Excellent. OK, so now we get to the sort of juicy part here. We have a lot of um, good questions that have come from the audience. And again, you still have an opportunity. Go ahead and submit questions in there. Um, this is a, a great opportunity for you to get to the answers to the questions that, that have been lingering and, and, and booming in your mind. OK, there's no such thing as a silly question in this case. So yeah, let's uh, let's start with the fact that we've gotten several questions that have already been answered. So folks are asking things like, where can they get more information from, about the Water First program? And so we've dropped that link in there uh, for you already. We're also seeing some questions. Just, so, just want to highlight some of these to make sure that you know that the responses are in, are in here. Um, we had folks asking about where can they find the GIFA YouTube channel? So we mentioned that we are recording this today and we do hope to, to um, get it fixed up and put online, hopefully. So I think that link is in there too as to where you can find that. All right, well, we'll go to a question that's come up for Sarah. And this one has to do with um, some of the conservation projects that you mentioned, Sarah. Uh, can you give some examples of water or wastewater utilities where GIFA has used the SRF programs to um, to fund their energy conservation type projects? Can you talk a little bit more sure. about that? Sure. Uh, recently, we funded a project using the blended interest rate uh, for the City of Social Circle because um, they replaced their old equipment with energy efficient equipment and installed SCADA controls um, into their wastewater system, or they are going to do that. And also um, they're going to do an INI or inflow and infiltration study. So all of those were eligible for the conservation interest rate. Excellent. Okay, thanks Sarah for that. Um, Larry, I think you mentioned something about uh, categorical exclusion, and we were just wondering, well, we have one person asking, is it pretty common to receive the, the categorical exclusion, or do most projects have to go through sort of a, the longer sort of process? Yeah, so uh, it, it, nothing is guaranteed, but if the applicant submits the application with uh, significant, I mean, sufficient information and states how the project meets the criteria uh, for a CE and EPD concurs, which is important, then the applicant will be granted a CE. Uh, if there are any questions about whether or not a project meets, you know, the criteria for a CE or none, feel 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 free to reach out to uh, EPD with the project description so you know how best to proceed. Great, thanks, Larry, and that's a good point. So even though we mentioned it on today's webinar, which is run by GFA, that that state environmental review process is really an EPD thing. So EPD runs that. So you can feel free to reach out to them directly. That said, we may have, um, you know, in future events based on partly on your evaluation uh, responses today, we may have one of the upcoming two webinars um, cover something to do with the state environmental review process if folks are really interested in that topic. Great. Thanks, Larry. Mm -hmm. 
like I mentioned, somebody asked about the Water First program and getting more information. And um, that is that's that link is in, you should be able to see, you know, just click on that to find out more. Someone also asked about joining the G for Lissive. Um, so making sure that you get updates here. We drop that link into the chat as well. All right, trying to pull up these questions here. Okay, this one is probably a good one for Sarah, but Larry, you can feel free to jump in afterwards too. So someone is asking, who's the best person to call first if we think we may want to apply for a GFO? That's a great question. You can reach out to any of GFA's project managers. Um, we're really happy to help and answer any questions you might have about GFA's programs. Okay. All right. Barry, did you want to add anything there? No, Sarah's, Sarah's correct. Uh, you can reach out to any of us and we'd be glad to help and uh, steer you in the right direction. Okay. So this next question is um, pretty general. So I can probably try to chime in and see if you'll have anything else to add, but someone is asking, from where does the Census Bureau get its annual data? Um, and I know Larry may have more to add on this, but basically Census has uh, an American Community Survey or ACS that, that gets updated every year. So it's like a subset, if you will, of this, the whole Census process. And so that data becomes available usually in the fall every year. The, the fresh data. So, Larry, anybody else have anything to add on that particular question? No, not much more to than what you said. They, uh, yeah, they collect data on an annual basis. You'll see them, you know, screening neighborhoods, going door to door, or whatnot, collecting that census information. Okay. Yeah, and that process is usually with the, the every ten year um, census, but. Um, the American Community Survey data is, like we said, a little bit more frequent. Um, so that's where a lot of the data that that tool, that affordability tool is coming from. All right, well, I'm gonna give folks another moment here to see if they wanna add any more questions. Those are the ones that we're seeing for right now. Um, and the staff here have been in the background doing a really good job of putting links in where they, those are relevant and sort of answering the questions by chat as well. So we appreciate that. Ansley, is there anything that um, we feel like we want to, to highlight in the questions so far from your perspective? Um, one other question that came through to me was, what is the age dependency ratio? Okay. Um, I answered Lisa, but for the full audience, um, that is a ratio of the population in your community that's either less than 18 or greater than 65, and then over the overall population. Yeah, and if I could add a little bit more context with that, we have some communities across the country, um, especially like in the Midwest too, where they're basically losing population and the population sector that they're losing is sort of the working age folks, right? So um, maybe there are not a lot of job opportunities or economic development needs to be boosted for the community, but you have a lot of the working age adults leaving and going to a bigger city, maybe close by to find jobs and who's remaining behind are the dependents. So the kids who generally don't work and older adults who are retired or, or don't work either. And so that nationally has been an important indicator for the economic situation of a given community. So that's why that one's included. All right, well, good. It seems that we're doing pretty well on time here like we expected. Thanks for those questions and feel free uh, as we're wrapping up here to go ahead and enter further questions. Um, I wanna just highlight a couple more things so again, hopefully this session gave you an opportunity to feel more empowered and able to sort of start this process on your own. You heard from the staff that if you do enter some responses, even like in the pre-application process and you get different information, you wanna change the, your responses for, what, for whatever reason, it's not written in stone. You contact the staff and they can help you sort of delete the old one and, 
and um, accept the new one and flag that, right? So again, they're pretty approachable, um, very open to discussions, give them a call, email them, and just start the conversation. If you're not sure if your project fits, the best thing to do is contact someone over there. They'll tell you if it fits drinking water or clean water SRF, maybe it's a good fit for the Georgia Fund. They're the experts, um, but you have to raise the questions with them and, and they'll help you explore those. So again, it's also great to get support from external consultants, et cetera, but at the end of the day, you as the local government entities are responsible for this loan and the requirements, et cetera. So you wanna make sure that you're comfortable and have a good handle on what's happening. And I think the goal of the staff at GIFA has to, been to make it pretty transparent. Um, for example, today you saw the affordability assessment tool that they use to come up with those affordability scores. And they'll also try to make it streamlined and, and doable for you, right? So that you don't have to have a degree in rocket science to fill out the pre-app, for instance. That said, there might be questions on there that pose a problem or they're not stated in the right way or whatever. There's no way for the staff to know unless you as the communities give them some feedback. So very open to that. Um, let us know, you know what, what can be improved um, and what, what difficulties your community might be facing. Because chances are, if you're facing an issue with one of the questions, um, there are other communities like you where the utilities can answer that question very easily either. So that feedback would be would be great. Again, there are a couple of webinars coming up too. So we may cover more things, for example, like the, the state environmental review process, procurement, maybe iron and steel requirements, but we're not going to set those agendas in stone today. We want to read your evaluations that will come up in a minute here as a link that you can click on and fill out some responses for us. Based on those responses, we'll, we'll decide on the best topics to focus the next two uh, G4 Water 101 webinars on. So encourage you to take a couple of minutes to do that. We are looking forward to using those results. Again, if you joined late, the handouts uh, in the form of a PDF are on the right side of your screen. We did record stuff today. You have the G4 YouTube channel where it should be showing up in a, in a week or so. And there might be an email too that takes you directly to this one. All right. In terms of Water First, we got a lot of questions on that particular um, program today. And there are a couple of training events coming up specifically on Water First. And so you can check out the G4 website to find out more information about those upcoming events. Or if you're on the list of, you should also receive that information in your inboxes. And there was a recorded session earlier this year as well. And that was pretty interesting. It was from the speakers were all recent designees um, who had received the Water First designation. And they kind of talked about, you know, the, the best parts, the easiest parts of the process and the most difficult parts of the process. This is another example of how the GIFA SRF program and just the, the, the program in general is pretty responsive to the needs of the state. So Water First is, I think, one of the best kept secrets in the water utility world in Georgia, where it's a significant discount on, you know, these large loan amounts over a long period of time. So even if there is some upfront work by your community staff or your utility staff to get that application in, it pays dividends. I mean, it's it's really worth the time and effort. Uh, so there's there's some information out there on kind of how to get started on that process and what to expect. So with that, I don't think any other questions have come in. And we did promise you that this was not going to take up the whole uh, time that we had highlighted on your on your calendars. So thanks so much for joining us. Stay tuned for the for the next. Uh, events and the notifications in the GFA newsletter. And again, just please go ahead and send any questions. We just dropped in the chat there the email address, the generic email address for the water resources division at GFA. So waterresources at gfa.ga.gov is where you can start if you don't know which specific individual you want to reach out to on the staff there. And then they'll sort of um, delegate your questions out among the water staff. So look forward to your responses on the evaluation. Thank you again so much for joining us today and for your great participation in the polls and the questions and the raising hands. Um, you kept it, you kept it interactive. And so we appreciate, we appreciate that participation. Have a great rest of your morning, everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you.